Good afternoon, everyone. And my name is Amanda Lichtenstein. I am the Director of Alumni Relations and Advancement for Burnethen College. Welcome to our first virtual Career Connections presentation. I'm delighted to have Lance Pendleton here joining us online. Um, Lance is the Head of Agent Development at Compass, and with that, he disrupts traditional approaches to real estate, creating, envisioning, building, and training on next generation tools for the company, its agents, and its clients. Lance specializes in the psychology of human behavior within a sales environment with a focus on developing business professionals who can humanize relationships and anticipate a client's needs. His mission is to drive innovative solutions that impact business and industry segments to deliver new growth opportunities and cultivate and commercialize market breakthroughs. Lance's programs integrate next generation skills with real life situations to help correlate the link between business success, success and interpersonal relationships, all focused on unique client experiences. Formerly the Chief Innovation Officer at the largest Sotheby's Realty affiliate in the world, he has also worked as a corporate sales trainer, business development specialist, speaker, and consultant to independent contractors and enterprises across the country. Lance brings more than 15 years of experience in the psychology of sales, personal development, management training, and education from a background including three Fortune 500 companies, including Apple. Today, you will share some insights from his career. We will have ample time for questions and answers, so please email your questions to us at alumni relations, that's A-L-U-M-N-I-R-E-L-A-T-I-O-N-S at bernathan.edu, or use the Q&A feature in this app. I will post the questions to Lance in the order in which I receive them. With that, I will turn the floor over to Lance. Lance, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here talking to everybody. Um, I didn't know this was the first digital version of this ever. Um, so we've already violated my first business rule, which is never be the first at anything because it doesn't go well. Um, so I will try and do my best to, to surprise and delight everyone. But um, thank you all for being here. I, I really appreciate, one, the opportunity to come talk and to um, share maybe some of my experience and um, some of the things I've learned along the way. Um, but I, I always love hearing people um, read my bio because I'm really not that important. And I think the first thing that I can tell you that I've learned in my career is that humility is the essence of any form of success whatsoever because um, I think that I've gotten to a spot in my life where I'm incredibly grateful for the opportunities that I've been given. Um, but everything I've gotten um, has been based on the kindness oftentimes of complete strangers. So uh, the, the awesomeness that sounds like what I do, really um, what I'm gonna talk through today is really more driven by the idea that if you learn to humanize the relationship that we have and uh, focus on networking with people, but in a, in a very meaningful um, and compassionate way, what you can find is that that actually will take you much, much further than um, a degree, much further sometimes than um, specialty training. Um, there's a lot of different things I think that we oftentimes overlook the value of in terms of just the basic human connection. So um, with that, I uh, had the great pleasure of doing a TED talk a while back ago. And um, I, I will tell you a, a very brief uh, true story about the, the, the TED talk was that uh, I was flattered to be offered the opportunity to do it. Um, and it was absolutely the most terrifying thing I ever did in my entire life. Um, no one really quite explained to me that in a TED talk, uh, there's no retake, there's no reshoot. Uh, you really only get one shot at it and that's it. And whatever it is, is what it is. Combined with the fact that, you know, when you do it, they then tell you, well, you only have nine minutes. And if you don't wrap up and land the plane in nine minutes, we'll walk up on the stage and take you off. That's how serious we are about that you only have nine minutes. So with all of that stress and all of that, you know, panic that sets in, I was uh, doing okay until the day of. And the day of, as I got closer and closer, I got more and more anxious. I got all the way to the point where they announced me. And as I walked up on the stage and they handed me the little clicker while I was going up, I noticed that my hand was shaking so much that I didn't really, I, I didn't really realize actually how nervous I was. And I remember thinking one of two things is gonna happen. Either my brain is gonna take over and I'm just gonna do what I do and, and things will be okay, or I'm gonna pass out on the middle of the stage and that will be what the world sees of my TED talk is, Here's all this wonderful thing about Lance Pendleton, and he, by the way, just flops on the floor, which actually probably would have gotten more views than what I did in the long run. But 
as I stepped up on stage, one of the things that they didn't say was in the final slide deck, which you'll see today, TED Talks don't actually put your job title up there because they're not about promoting who you are and what you do for a company or anything else. They're more encompassing what you do or sort of holistically on the whole. So they didn't tell me what they were putting up there. So I walked up on stage, they popped the first slide up behind me and it said my name followed by relationship strategist. To which in the back corner of the room as I'm standing now about to start talking, they flash this up and all you hear is someone go, <laughs> and I, I literally paused and panic and I looked out and it was my fiance sitting in the back right now corner and I thought, oh, that's not the way I wanted to start this, but it actually helped because it took me out of what I was in and I just kind of fired through and it lessened the intensity of the moment. So it was um, in, in that process from a, a business standpoint, you know, what I've learned over the years is that I've had a lot of great opportunity to try different things in my life and I've had a lot of jobs. Um, I remember sitting with my, my sister, another fellow uh, Bernathan alumni, uh, one time saying to me, you know, I, I don't know anyone that's had as many jobs, I think, as you have. And you, you've been pretty good at all of them, but man, you've had a lot of jobs. And it's true, I have. And one of the things that I would encourage you is to be a learner of life. Um, those jobs were all things that the pieces that I took from them were invaluable to what I do now. And I've learned over the years that each one of those things gave me a different tool and a different skill set that allowed me, when I finally got into my sweet spot of doing what I do currently, um, to really, really be good at it and to be really comfortable at it. And none of them had something distinctly similar. So it's not like, you know, I went and got a degree in um, engineering and then I was an architectural engineer and that's what I've done always since. I moved around from firm to firm. I mean, I've been all over the map in my career of different things. But the one common underlying theme of the different jobs I had over the years was that they all, they, they were all connected to people and that they were me being in front of people, working directly with people in a very tangible way um, to improve the quality of their life in some capacity. Uh, oftentimes driven behind the idea of education and I do not have any formal training. So what happens is I've actually had to learn a la the Steve Jobs way, and I'm not comparing myself to Steve Jobs, but from somebody who had to learn through life and life's examples in order to then figure out what mattered the most in making human connections. So what I try and do is in the business setting where I work currently, um, I am the head of agent development for Compass Real Estate. And Compass Real Estate is the fastest growing company, not real estate company, but company in the United States today. Uh, we are currently in what's known as hyper growth. We just finished a series F round of funding. Uh, when I joined the company uh, two and a half months ago, we were valued at $2.2 billion. By the Friday after I joined, which was on a Monday, we were valued at $4.4 billion. Um, and we are continuing. We started the year in 2018 with 30 real estate offices in the country. We will finish the year with 170 real estate offices in the country. Um, we had 1,400 real estate employees or agents, sorry. Um, at the beginning of the year, we will finish with 8,000. And uh, we are the first real estate company to offer uh, healthcare to real estate agents because real estate agents are independent contractors. Uh, they are not eligible for company provided benefits because they're not employees of a company. They are 1099 people. So with that being said, the reason I joined the company that I joined after being the chief innovation officer for Sotheby's Realty was because of the challenge that they are really a tech company. So Compass is a tech company that has uh, done an amazing job of developing technology that supports a real estate agent's everyday business. So our, our goal from a technology standpoint is to simplify the process of what agents do. The problem that we encounter when we do that is, is that you're dealing with uh, independent contractors that don't necessarily have a specific skill set in the use of technology. Real estate's average age of an agent is 56 years old. And that's the average, the dominant factor in real estate. Um, we are the largest demographic, I'm proud to say, of female uh, entrepreneurs in the country. Um, we are the largest demographic as well, too, of independent people and workers in the entire country. Um, and real estate is something where you are directly, intrinsically involved in the most stressful aspect or moment of someone's entire life, um, or one of the top three, I should say. The three biggest stressors actually are death, uh, loss of a job, and the third one used to be 
Um, I'm drawing a blank right now. The third one is death, loss of a job, and uh, oh, it was death, loss of a job, and it was a what they call a, a life change, a life event, which would have been a birth or any type of massive life event. That's actually flopped to fifth now, and that buying and selling a home, by the way, is now number three. So buying and selling a house or move is the third largest stressor. And here you have someone whose primary role is to insert themselves into the most stressful aspect that you're going to have. It's also the largest financial decision that anyone will ever make for the most part. Because of that, what happens is, is that level of stress combined with now we're trying to involve technology into the, into the process. If you have a demographic of people who may not be completely comfortable with the use of technology that may have very set ways in which they do things, and are now being put into a position where they have to match head on someone who's already coming into their relationship in a stressful environment, uh, it's hard, you know? And I always say this, if you think about what an agent does, if someone wants to sell their home, this agent comes in cold, sits down, and oftentimes begin discussing, well, what do you think your home is worth? And the price of someone's home, something that's very personal to them in that capacity. This is the equivalent of me going on a blind date and sitting down and in the first five seconds of the blind date saying, how do you think we should save for our children's college tuition? Like, it, it, it's just awkward. Someone's going to throw a glass of drink in my face and we're done at that point in time. So that how you get to build trust in those relationships is incredibly, incredibly difficult. Then let's layer on top of that real estate does not have trust built into it as an industry on the whole. Um, true fact, globally, they ranked trust in industries. Uh, real estate ranked below uh, car sales, and that used to be one of the lower ones. We've actually now ranked below car sales, um, and we actually ranked below prostitution, believe it or not. So just to give you an idea, that's actually more trusted than uh, real estate on the whole. So when you have all of these different factors and emotionalities that come into something, I made a transition into a company because I believe in it was the most fruitful place for me to take a skill set of helping people relate at the human level to somebody else and develop a skill set that I've worked on over the years of teaching and educating adults in the sales industries on what we call humanistic sales. So my career has been a slow moving coup, as I like to say, into falling into what I learned, which was that the greatest relationships that we develop and the best ways that we can actually be successful is by truly nurturing the, the relationship that we have but by really humanizing it to find empathy in the process. So I'm gonna go through a, a bit of what I talked about in my TED talk, just so you have an understanding of how that works within what we do, but it's applicable to any type of industry um, and, and anything that is relationship driven. So whether you're working with clients, uh, customers, whether you work in a sales environment, even if you work in an environment where you might be, uh, let's say an engineer on an engineering team, but you need to find better ways to relate to the people that you have on your engineering teams so that you get more, better communication and improve the quality of the relationship so that you actually can kind of look better in what you do and they embrace you more for the ideas you bring to the table. All of these things actually apply within the same environment. Um, so I'm gonna switch over to share my screen here. And I will pop this up. So as you can see, we started off with the idea of, of me being a relationship strategist. Um, and Amanda, can you all, you can hear me and see my screens? Yep, yeah, I can see you and hear you, you're great. Um, I am not a relationship strategist. Um, I happen to uh, try and identify different things that we actually experience in life and how do we bring them into those relationships that we carry. So I'm gonna talk about something that is a, a very, very common factor to all human beings across. Um, human beings are actually quite simple. We like to think we're more complex than we are, and we complicate things, believe it or not, intentionally to make ourselves feel better. It's a self-soothing technique that we have internally. I know it sounds strange, but the reality of it is, is that we will complicate anything for our own protection, and it's completely counterintuitive oftentimes. But in this one scenario, what we'll talk about is uh, something that happens in our minds all day long. So what I want you to envision is you are going away on vacation, and you need to leave someone home in charge of the house to take care of the dogs and water the plants when you leave on this vacation. And you're super excited to leave on this vacation. This time when you go on vacation, what you're gonna do is you're gonna leave my friend George in charge of the house. Now, 
I want you just to think for a minute of what the house is going to look like after a long weekend when you get home because you've left George in charge. And if you have teenagers, you already know the answer to this question, but it's not going to be pretty. And what happens is, is this is actually what goes on in our mind all day long. We actually leave George in charge of what happens going on in our mind. And it's actually something that Buddhists call monkey mind. And in Buddhism, monkey mind is the idea of stacking and stacking is this thing that we do. And you probably notice it more when you drive in a car where you're driving along and your radio's on and you're thinking to yourself, wow, you know, I don't really, really wonder if I actually sent that email that I was supposed to send earlier. And I can't remember if I sent that or not, but I should probably send that later when I actually go to there. And did I buy cranberry for Thanksgiving yet? I need to get cranberry sauce. So oh, that cranberry is so disgusting because I don't really like that cranberry sauce anymore, but I don't think the kids are going to like it. I'm wondering if just Taylor, is, does Samantha's shirt, did we iron that for her? What you've done is you've continued to layer thought after thought after thought until you're so far from the original thought that it's just frenetic energy that's kept going. And what happens is, is that when you go down this path with each one of those layered thoughts that you do, stress comes from. And we tend to actually build around that. And that is monkey mind. It's that process that our minds are in constant motion, constant flux, and it makes it very difficult for us to stay grounded into something. It keeps us not mindful and not present. So your mind compartmentalizes into two separate functions. And most people, as part of that safety mechanism, lean one way or the other intuitively. And you have two mindsets that you will drift to. One of them is known as the emotional mind, and one of them is the reasonable mind. Now, both of them, we have a predominant driver where we lean one way or the other because it's where we seek the most comfort. So what is the reasonable mind? A reasonable-minded person likes things in a linear process. So reasonable-minded people are people that like Excel spreadsheets. They like numbers, analytics, data. They like to have things lined up in process. Maybe it's somebody that uh, when putting things away on a shelf wants to break out the label maker because they like then having things alphabetized because it makes them feel better. Uh, Reasonable-minded people tend to come to conclusions based off of conscious logical thought process of A leads to B leads to C leads to D and that's how we get to them. They see great comfort in that process and that's how they sort of, that's their banky blanket, right? You then have an emotional minded person and the emotional minded person finds their comfort by actually placing logic through understanding and feeling the emotionality that comes through something, whether it be something that is sadness, joy, uh, they tend to connect and relate to something better by understanding how it makes them feel rather than through actually finding the logical process into something. And that emotional minded person usually brings the emotional aspect into it in order for them to make sense of something. So let's talk about what those two things look like overlapping each other. If you have the ability to come slightly towards center off of if you're an emotional minded person, a little more into that reasonable mindset, or if you're a reasonable minded person and you can drift further toward the center into that area, that's what's actually known as wise mind. Wise mind is the place where you're neither too emotional nor too reasonable. You have common understanding. Many times the thing that you're going to see this most commonly played out in is when people are processing the aspect of death. Some people, when someone close to them that they're very, uh, that they care about very much dies, they, some folks will go right into deep, deep grief. They go into great depths of emotion. They're inconsolable. They're besides themselves. They are very driven by that deep emotion that they have and connecting to that person off of that. Other people, and, and by the way, when they, when they roll through that process of grief, right, eventually they will kind of place that to the side and come back into a bit of reason. You then have someone else that when someone close to them passes, immediately goes into action. They go into organizing the, the wake or the funeral. They go into planning the flowers. They go into calling all the friends and loved ones. And they don't connect to an emotion off that. They go into action. That's a reasonable-minded behavior. Either way, when the process ends and they've exhausted all of those and they can't be any more emotional or they can't be any more reasonable, they actually come to that wise mind, which is a great place of acceptance where it's a combination of sadness and understanding. And that overlap is that wise mind state. In daily life, these get played out in very, very different ways. But the real thing is is that what you can learn from a business setting or being in the relationships that you have is that if you're able to actually recognize in someone else what mindset they're in, 
when they're going through or processing something, you actually can connect to them in a much deeper way because you have the ability to bridge the gap by understanding and seeing it in them. Now, I happen to be a much more emotional minded person. I happen to be in a relationship with someone that happens to be much more reasonable. And because that, that's why we work well together because when processing very difficult things that we both might be going through, I can be in full emotion and my partner can actually be the reasonable side to bring me to wise mind. The same way that when my partner's in a very reasonable mindset and not really understanding that what they're doing is avoiding certain emotions, I can talk more about those emotions to bring that person into that wise mindset. It's a much more loving and compassionate way to be. Now, I'm gonna talk and use an example of everyday life that I like to use. And Muhammad Ali, this is a true story. Muhammad Ali, for, for those of you that, that uh, know of him, was an incredibly emotional person. He was filled with bravado. He was filled with a, a, a very, very intense sense of ego. He was incredibly articulate, incredibly driven toward making sure the world understood that his emotions were the biggest, most important things happening at that time. And because of that, oftentimes it was very difficult to actually get him to focus on things. He was about to go to fight, uh, I believe it was George Foreman in the Rumble in the Jungle, and he was being followed around by a boxing reporter uh, as, he tr as he traveled across the country, getting, in prepar getting prepared for this fight. And the boxing reporter happened to have been there for something that happened. And he was sitting on an airplane on a Pan Am flight. Uh, they were waiting to take off. And the boxing reporter was asking questions. And Muhammad Ali was in just full effect. He was going to, I'm going to bury the fool. I'm going to hit him so hard his children feel it. I'm going to, he was doing his thing and he was going all off. And the stewardess had come over and told him now on three separate occasions that he needed to put his seatbelt on so the plane could take off. And they've been sitting on the runway for 10 minutes now and he's ignored this completely. And the stewardess finally just got angry and came over to them the fourth time and said, Mr. Ali, you need to put your seatbelt on now. And he looked up at her and he said, baby, Superman don't need no seatbelt. She looked down at him and said, with all due respect, Mr. Ali, Superman doesn't need the plane either. Now put the goddamn seatbelt on so we can take off. Now, what she just did was take someone in full emotional mind and bring him right back into reasonable mind, helping him put his seatbelt on and the plane took off. But it's the greatest example of how in those moments we have the opportunity, whether through levity, even sometimes in frustration, to bring up something incredibly of the opposite mindset effect. We see this in daily life oftentimes where you'll have one person who is in, and you can look for this when you're looking and, and, you're, and you're practicing this skill set in the people that you come in contact with, and it's easiest in the people that you're closest with to start with. But come in contact with someone, and I'll give this example where you have a reasonable minded person where let's say I'm ready to leave. We're constantly late for something, right? Always late to get to some event, wherever we're going, we're just always late. And let's say this person, my partner, shows up and again, they're late. I've been sitting around for 20 minutes, ready to go. They just rolled in the door. And I look and I say, what, what's going on? Why are we late? And they'll say to me, oh, I'm so sorry, but I was driving here and I came down Smith Street and I made the right on Smith Street. And then I actually made a left on cue because the traffic was bad. And when I made a left on cue, I noticed that there was a weird car that had all these camera things on it. I don't know if it was one of those Google Earth cars or not but maybe it was Apple Maps, I don't really know, but the weird thing they had on it was like it would move, but then I wondered, is it actually recording me? So I was totally freaked out by the fact that it was gonna be recording me. So I missed the exit that I was supposed to get off on, but I don't really understand why they actually record those things the way they do, because they don't seem to be right most of the time anyway. Now, I'm now losing my mind even more because I'm sitting here going, what does any of this have to do with the fact that we're late? So I can actually ask this person right there, slightly change that and go, okay, that, hold on one second. How do you feel when we're late? I, I'm just curious, when, when, when we're late, how does it make you feel? And oftentimes they'll pause and stop and go, well, I don't know. I mean, I feel badly. Okay, well, can we actually find a way, because I start to feel badly about this, can we find a way that when you're going to be late in advance, let me know so I can, and you'll find commonality because they then will be more soft into the idea that there was an emotion behind this, that there's actually something and going into the reasoning behind why is not nearly as important as understanding the emotional aspect to bring them closer to that wise mind, to find that empathetic center. Another way that you're gonna see this oftentimes is with children. Children bring big emotion. And often you will see this in helping them, you can, you can do a, a cool Jedi mind trick with a kid. You'll see them have a complete meltdown and go from zero to 100. And it looks like this. Timmy is there, you've told Timmy, no, we're not gonna buy candy, put the candy back, we're in a store. No, no, we're not buying candy. 
and Timmy loses it. I like candy and I can't believe it. I can't candy and they don't buy me anything. And oh, you're going, oh boy, here we go. If you pause and look at the child and say, Timmy, I, I, just really quickly, Timmy, what's, what's two plus two? Tell me, Timmy, what's two plus two? I four. That's great. You're a genius, Timmy. Okay, Timmy, what's what's four plus one? Do you know what four plus one? And five. Awesome. What's what's two minus one? Do you know what two minus one is? Uh, three. Okay. What's happened now is you've taken someone that is in full emotional mindset and asked them reasoning questions, which drew them out of the emotional mindset and placed them into reasoning. In therapeutic world, if people suffer from uh, anxiety disorders, panic disorders, this is actually something that's a technique that's often used because when someone is having a panic attack, they are in full-blown emotional mind. And if you take someone that's in a panic attack and ask them the same type of questions or ask them to tell you, when you start the car, when you get in your car, tell me what you do to start a car. And they actually have to mentally visualize the picture of I, I open the door, what does the door look like? And then, okay, so what you sit and then what do you do? What does the key look like? When you walk them through that process and they articulate every step of that, the panic attack begins to subside because you're shifting out of the emotional mindset. So these are things that happen. And we oftentimes do this because in that wise mind state, when we're looking at dealing with people from a, a business standpoint, what I teach and what I educate on is if you're working with a client and that client is in an emotional state or in a reasoning state, in order to better help them make better decisions or improve the quality of the relationship you have with them, if you can visualize and understand what state they happen to be in and then quickly identify what question can I ask them to drift them back toward the center, it actually creates an increase in trust they have in you because one, people like answering questions. They like telling you things about themselves. They like telling you their opinions, their thoughts, their feelings. If you don't believe me, just look at Facebook or Yelp. People intrinsically love talking about themselves or about how they feel about things. So just by asking them a relevant question in some capacity, one, that's increasing the trust they're going to have in you. And two, they begin to recognize that because you've asked them something and they technically then came to a wise mind state, they feel better. That increases the trust because if in conversations with you, they recognize that they feel better after the conversation with you that softens that relationship as you go through. In real estate, we come across this, and I'll just give you a practical application, where because you're dealing in such an intense emotional time with people, that intense emotional time, you're gonna have a couple that's thinking about selling their home, and in the conversation, you're gonna have one person who oftentimes goes into the reasonable mind. They're talking about the idea that, let's say they're looking at the financial aspects of something of, you know what, well, we did, redid the kitchen and the kitchen cost us $40,000 to redo. And then we also put new light bulbs in it everywhere. And they start looking at the financial analytics and they start saying, well, when we price the house, we have to take all that into equation. Well, what you can do into something like that is ask that person, well, you know, what do you look forward to the most when you move? Oh, fuck. You know, every time it snows, all this happens and I don't have to deal with that anymore. I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna love moving into an apartment because I don't have to deal with that anymore. Great, well, what, what do you look forward to the most about that apartment that you saw that you keep talking about? Oh, the fact that it's got a doorman, I love the doorman. They'll talk about the emotionality of things that they look forward to and it drifts them away right there automatically off of all of that reasoning and that linear aspect of the equation of money because it helps them detach from that visualization. And vice versa, if you have somebody that's very emotional when they talk about the selling of their home and they want to price their home because, you know, Timmy lost his first tooth here and you, you spent so many great, wonderful Thanksgivings here and that's where baby had his first steps. If you say that's wonderful and, and, and I love that you think about those things, just a quick thing. Part of my job right now is to, is to understand a few things of your home. How much do you spend each month on electric? Great. I mean, how, how much do you spend each month on oil? And how much do you spend on lawn care? And so how much are you spending on? And when you start having them start to think about how much they're actually spending each month on the cost of things, bringing them that reasonable concept of you can want to stay here forever and overprice this, but you're hemorrhaging money on the back end here. That helps them soften that aspect. So we go through that. And when you, when you help people in that mindset of the drift of it, in the long run, that empathetic connection is beneficial to them because you're helping them get away from the things that oftentimes we get locked into. 
because we overcomplicate things, drifting towards the emotional mindsets or the reasonable mindsets in order to find that sense of safety, helping unlock that for somebody with them and being part of that process and being able to humanize your relationship to connect increases their trust, makes them want to have a better connection, use you more from a sales standpoint, trust your expertise in certain things, or from a working relationship point, identify the places where you can actually build a better mousetrap from an engineering standpoint, solve bigger and better problems, get promoted faster by having an understanding with your boss that you, when you work with your boss, are in that different type of partnership to really listen to how they operate to try and find that middle ground with them. When you quiet that monkey, that's what we call that wise mind because at the end, we just want George to be happy. So this is what I go through in, in, in a daily aspect of teaching uh, the people that I work with. Um, oftentimes, some of the coolest parts of uh, my job is getting this place in this process that when I work with sales professionals on a daily basis, how do I help them understand that their real job is to stop selling? Humanistic sales is the art of not selling anything. Really. It's about connecting to people in a real way and also understanding sometimes in our relationships, people are toxic and I can't help you. And if you are bat guano crazy, there's nothing I can do for you and I'm going to make myself sick in the process of trying to satisfy that for you. So this all has sort of come from my years of, of uh, experience in different aspects of the jobs I've had. And I, you know, I had the pleasure of working for Apple, learning how to teach and train on relationship building. Um, some of the wonderful things I learned in the secrets of Apple is they actually look for people who know nothing about computers um, because there's no better way for you to connect to somebody that doesn't know anything about technology than when you look at them honestly and say, I don't know, but we'll find out together. That actually builds more trust right off the bat than being an expert in something. You know, um, We all wanna be experts. The reality of it is, I'll tell you right now, what I don't know could just about fill the Grand Canyon and that's the most impactful thing that I can probably offer in that sense. But um, you know, I'll open up to questions if, if, if you guys have questions, but um, I, I would hope that, and by the way, I know there's a good chance that my sister uh, is listening to this. So if you see Wendine Pendleton bus on there, you're not allowed to ask any questions that she asks because uh, I guarantee you, they're probably things like, Oh, did you ever burp at work? So not allowed. Go ahead. <laughs> Everything else is on the table. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was great. It was great. Um, oh, sorry. Audio it glitched. Um, so my first question is how did you break into the field that you're in? What, what drove you to, uh, be in the field that you're in now? Uh, pure, purely accidental. Um, I, I was in the uh, adult education through, uh, when I worked for Apple, I worked as a, as a specialist and I was a market trainer for them, um, in which I taught all of their uh, new store opening, new employee orientations. Um, and I learned a lot through that. I loved being in front of people. I loved talking about improving the quality of their life, improving their job skills not so much in the HR aspect of things, but really trying to connect more into how do you have a, a, how do you love what you do, right? How do you take something that you may have to actually be doing a lot of rinse and repeat all day long and really find a way to love what you do? Um, so I came into to doing that and I learned so many amazing things about really the hospitality industry and the hospitality business um, from Apple and behavioral psychology that I learned that I had a, a great passion for understanding the why behind people do things. Uh, so I started studying behavioral psychology on the back end. Um, and then through my own life experiences of being in therapy myself and, and figuring out, you know, why do I think that way? And, and why am I so frustrated by this? Why do these people annoy me so much? And learning that the problem wasn't external, the problem was internal. I then would start going, wait a second, if I have that experience, other people have that experience. How do I begin to recognize that in somebody else? And then how do I empathize with that rather than get annoyed with them? You know, the hardest thing in the world to do, I think, is to be in a spot where someone is just angry. And although they're yelling at you, it's not about you. You know, I don't know if the person that's currently yelling at me is upset because their spouse has uh, MS and they don't know how to deal with it. They don't understand how to process, how to help the frustrations of realizing that someone they love one is deteriorating in front of them, whether it be through Alzheimer's. I happen to be someone standing in front of them and they're, they're just angry, you know? And how do I not take that personally? And how do I find a way to connect and empathize with them and turn that around was something that I found most interesting. Because of that, when I started teaching and training, 
I detached and kind of left that world and realized that there's a whole separate industry out there that has an untapped resource that's even harder. Corporate America requires and mandates training, you know? So that was one thing that I thought, okay, that's great. The real estate industry, you actually can't require a mandate training of a 1099 person. They're independent contractors. It's illegal. You can't use the word mandate or required. So how do you create education for people that don't have to show up and really don't want to be there at all? You know, so that was an even bigger challenge. And that's why I, I drifted into that sort of accidentally. I went and sold real estate for a while um, to learn what do these people do and how does it work? Realize that I was just terrible at it. You'd think that because I teach people how to do it, I'm good at it. No, I'm not. I realize I love working with buyers because that's the fun part. You know, I didn't like working with sellers. I was really good at landing the plane and getting a listing. And then I want to deal with them after that because they were frustrated and annoyed and irritated. And I just, it wasn't fun, you know? So, um, but I, but I moved my way into being the director of uh, education for uh, Sotheby's um, and then a VP of uh, business development for them. And then eventually chief innovation officer, because I came up with creative ways to accelerate their business. Um, and the, the last piece I'll say on how I kind of came into that was networking was the biggest thing. Um, I learned it from my father. My father told me when I was younger and much like everything else that we're told by our parents when we're younger, I was like, networking, come on, you're old. What do you know? You know, you're not hip and cool and young. Um, he was a thousand percent right. It was one of the most impactful, important things my father ever taught me um, was that the value of those real meaningful relationships are the thing that will take you the furthest in life. I um, mean, I've worked really hard now. Um, and I got a super late start in life to learn how to make those connections and, and, and be present for the places where people said, you know what, maybe you'd be good at this. You know, I'm going to give you a shot at that because they had seen me and, and, and believed in me because I connected with them. Do you think that the social media landscape is changing the way that networking works nowadays in the professional world? Uh, yes. Um, I see this every single day. Um, I, I will say social media and and mass email marketing um, are the two biggest things that that severely dramatically injure our ability to connect. Um, I know that it's the quickest, easiest way to put yourself out there and to communicate and to stay in touch. Um, but we've lost the art of, of being present and being connected to people. Um, I'm a little bit frightened by what comes next. Um, I had a really good friend of mine that trained me years ago. He was the uh, head trainer for the uh, New York City Police Department. And he said that he had a real, real concern that uh, the new uh, cadets coming into the police academy, um, he had never seen anything like it before because they were phenomenal at, at the driving course testing and education where they could drive the cop car going 150 miles an hour in a high speed chase while using the computer at the same time. Literally one hand on the wheel working the system. They could multitask and, and deal with that process and process in ways he'd never seen before. And he said, and then when you take them to a domestic situation, everyone in the room is going to get shot because they don't know how to communicate. They don't know how to, they don't know how to find compassion and empathy. Everything immediately gets escalated and it becomes a nightmare. And he said, I, I've never seen such a disparity. And it's because that social media landscape now has created an environment where it's so easy to think that we've connected that I can then walk away and go do something else. And, you know, a really frightening statistic that I find terrifying is that young people now, um, women are young girls. Actually, the suicide rate of young girls has increased 70% in the past 10 years compared to 30% in boys. And the reason for that is boys are late to the social media game. And they're late to that social media game because they're more into the video games and those types of things. They don't come in until much later where girls much more driven to be present, put themselves out there, a picture of a pretty dress, a picture of something that they like, them hanging out with their friends, and then they sit back and wait for the responses to seek that validation. Um, and, and what happens is that validation doesn't come or it comes in negative ways. And it's disparaging in that aspect and because they're not connected and going and playing with friends and being connected in that sense. So that social media sphere makes that business world of the networking so much more difficult and, and very, very hard to, to um, find attachment. And the irony is I work in a tech industry. So it's, it's, it's the greatest challenge of my career to understand how do you use social media to gain awareness and to communicate without losing that, that important touch point of being connected to people in a real organic human way. 
I just want to say for those listening to um, to get in-person connections, you can always contact our office and we'll pair um, younger alumni or students with uh, older, more experienced alumni um, that are working in their career field. So there are avenues um, to get connected with people that is outside of social media and then you can start to build relationships that work for you in your, in your industries. Um, so let me ask, if you think back to five years ago, the social media landscape was a little bit different, um, but aside from social media, if you think back five years ago, did you envision your career as it is today? Or did you, did, was this always kind of a game plan? I know that you had kind of a circuitous route to where you are, but did you think that you would come along this way? No, not at all. Um, as I said in the beginning, I mean, I, I've been incredibly fortunate, very blessed, and very, very lucky to have come across people in my life who gave me a chance when others wouldn't, um, who saw something in me that they went, I, I, I don't know what that is, but you're passionate, you're kind of funny, and I think we can use that, you know? Um, and if I look back five, six years ago for me, I wasn't even sure that I was going to um, be able to identify what career I wanted to be in. Um, I had tried so many different things and, and some and been successful in all of them, but sort of became bored with all of them at a certain point in time. I'd get them to a point, and that's more of something with me, not them, um, that I didn't realize that I spent a lot of time trying to run away from what I was good at. Because, you know, saving the world and creating a food blog and, you know, to convincing people that McDonald's was bad was like way more fun because I could change the world. And what I realized was, was that nobody cares. You know, I, I, me trying to revolutionize the system is running up the down escalator. Um, and when you keep landing on the same thing over and over again, I, I sort of think it's the spiritual way of being told like, no, 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 th this is what you're good at. Like, think about what happens if you actually embrace this and really tried to own it and make it your own. Um, so I, I think that that was the, the big wake up call for me was when I stopped trying to run away from what I did. Everything landed back in people, people, people and helping and through the adult education and driving that process. So I was like, all right, let's do this. And I got, I got lucky. A lot of people gave me chances when a lot of people wouldn't. Well, so that brings me to another question, which is, can you talk about a role that you applied for and worked in that you weren't maybe 100% qualified for when you started? and how did you proceed in that role? You mean besides when I was 15, my father told me I had to get a job, hook me up and network me with one of his friends and I was tarring roofs in the middle of summer and I <laughs> never showed up again? Yeah, no, that was not an industry for me. Um, something I tried that, say the question again, I wanna make sure I answer it like. So if, uh, if there was a role that you had that you weren't maybe 100% qualified for if you saw a job description in advance that you still were able to apply for and, and get, and how did you work in that job when maybe you weren't coming in completely, um, you know, ticking every box on the job description? Um, that's a great question. The irony is I think almost every one of my jobs has felt that way to me. You know, I think there was an element of the job that I thought, hey, this is cool. I think I'd be good at this. And then I created my own path in it, if that makes sort of any sense. Um, you know, I started off um, going years ago. I mean, I, I worked in, in my, my first sort of college job was I worked for a balloon bouquet company. And I was literally making these balloon bouquets and these big arches for events and stuff like that. But... I had no qualifications for this, like balloon bouquets. I was like, give me a break, it's ridiculous. But the owner, it was a mom and pop shop, and the owner kind of recognized that when I would talk to clients, that when they would come in to talk about, like, we're having a bat mitzvah and we want this, that I would sway them into things, sort of, that they didn't really know that they hadn't thought they wanted, and we would then add on and add on and add on. But it wasn't like escalating for price purposes or trying to price gouge them. It was more that I would kind of connect with them in a way that I would kind of say, well, you're going to spend on that, but what about that? You know, and they would get excited by it. Um, and it was how I found sales really. Um, because I realized at a certain point in time that I could use my superpowers that had been used in the past for evil, like getting out of taking tests and convincing a teacher that I know you just gave me a D, but it really should be a B. And somehow they would change the grade. God knows why, because I would just talk my way into it. Um, that that actually could be used to benefit and help people a little bit. And I kind of really enjoyed that process. 
Um, but I've never taken a job where I've said, wow, that's me. That's what I do. It was always a part of, I do think that when you go into a job that you may not be completely suited for, you have to be willing to be able to say, these are my strengths, these are my weaknesses, and be really confident in understanding that a lot of the business landscape now tries to improve people's you know, areas of opportunity. I can't stand when I hear that in business, you know, your areas of opportunity. Guess what? If you're 25, 30 years old, whatever that might be, and you're not good at something, I'm sorry, that's okay. We don't need to change you into something else. Embrace the fact that I'm not good at that. Let's really maximize what you're awesome at, find that, and then leverage that to the hilt because that's where you're gonna love what you do. If I spend all my time trying to convince you to do something that you're not that great at or changing something, you're gonna resent it eventually and move on, right? So I think more and more companies now and bigger corporations, I know Compass right now is super passionate about finding what you're passionate about and maximizing that. And I started with my company right now. I was actually hired for a, I was interviewed for the national sales manager director position. By the end of, sales manager isn't dealing with that. By the end of that conversation, they were like, yeah, that's not for you. We have this other thing that you think you'd be great, which is called the head of agent as CEO. And I was like, I don't know what that is, but it sounds interesting. Let's do that. And within three weeks, they changed my title over to the head of agent development, put me on a national roadshow, uh, promoting the new content management system to get agents to understand why the technology matters. Like, and I just fit. It was great. I love being on the road and talking to people. Companies more and more are now recognizing, like, we may have hired you for this, but if you're really good at why, we need to go that route. But be honest about it. Don't sell people on something you're not good at because it's going to show really quickly. Can you talk about a time where you made a mistake at a position you had, and then how did you bounce back from that mistake? Okay, so we go back to yesterday. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think one of the things for me was a harder lesson was I made the mistake one time of trying to get myself promoted by pointing out someone else's shortcomings, something they had done wrong. Um, I was incredibly ego-driven and very, very much self-centered. Um, and, and I knew somebody had done something that I was the only person that knew about, and I knew that they had screwed it up. I knew that it had fallen by the wayside, and it was caught, but nobody knew who did it. Um, and I was real quick to go into the boss's office and be like, this person did that, and if it were me, I would have done that. I would have done something different, blah, blah, blah. And I, I remember that they... Um, they, they got let go. Um, and I remember how horrible I felt when they got let go because I realized it was me. I did that. Um, and I didn't, you know, growing up, I didn't always make the smartest decisions. I didn't always do the, the, the kindest, nicest things for people. Um, I wasn't a great person when I first started in a lot of different ways. Um, and later on, um, I actually ran into that person years later, um, in a, in a retail store I was working in. Um, and I and I was able to apologize to them and tell them straight up that was me. I did that, um, and I'm really, really, really sorry about it. Um, and I owned it. Um, ironically, they said it actually worked in their favor because they had found something else that that ended up being better in the long run. Um, and the cool thing is, is I had an opportunity to refer them to another company. Um, as I was um, doing some work for this company on the side, kind of like a freelance thing. And they said, oh, we're looking for someone. And I was like, hey, you know what? That person was awesome. And that networking capability now, I was able to kind of refer them. Um, and they ended up working for that company. I had a great experience. So it worked out really, really well. But I wasn't proud of myself. And to this day, I'm sort of like, yeah, you know what? I, I think the bounce back that you have to have in the business world is, you know, if you make a mistake, own it. And own it sooner rather than later. Um, people are so much more forgiving and much more understanding when, when you say, my bad, I, I screwed it up. Um, when you try and cover it up, it gets so much worse. Absolutely. Um, so if you could give one single piece of advice, it may be the one you just said, but if it's not something different, if you could give one single piece of advice to those starting out in their careers, what would it be? Wow. Um, be you. You know, I, I, I spent so much of my life trying to be anything but me that I think it was only later that I recognized that unless I was sort of true to my authentic self, I was never really going to be happy doing anything I was doing. 
Um, and when you're really brutally honest, I think, with yourself about who you are and, and what you like, it's not about finding a job that matches that. It's about finding how whatever job you're in, that part of you stands out. You know, if you have a job where, you know what, right now the only thing I can do is work in a factory, you know, making widgets. And that's not what I'm passionate about. That's not, be the person that starts a, a, a charitable giving program for them. Because if that's what you're passionate about and, and you know, nonprofit is where you wanted to be, but right now you got to put food on the table and you got to do what you got to do to keep a roof over your head so you're not living in mom and dad's basement anymore. You know, do that. Find ways that, that you can be passionate about something in what you're doing, even if it's not the most opportune thing for yourself. Um, the perfect job does not exist. No one is going to hand you something and be like, oh, this is, you know, the greatest thing because I have the utmost in faith. And also recognize, I think sometimes in starting for the first time in different things or in, ch in changes and job changes and careers, you're not that important. You're just not. I, I wish somebody had told me that earlier on because I lived so often feeling like I either if I wasn't, I had to be the most important person in the room. I had to make myself the most important person in the room. Um, Spider-Man once said that with great power comes great responsibility. I actually think it's actually with great humility comes great responsibility. Um, find ways to be humble in what you do because people will absolutely want to work with you more. They'll want to promote you. They'll want to be a champion of you um, if you're humble in what you do. And so are there any resources out there that you'd recommend um, maybe that you've used to help improve your career or forward your career that you might recommend to, to uh, um, our younger crowd that's listening? Yeah, I, I can't, I'm not a reader. I can't stand for, I don't, I don't like literally, I don't read. I don't like it. I'm a TV consumer. I'm a, you know, visual input junkie. Um, so when someone always told me like the great CEOs of the world read 14 books a day, I'm like, oh, that's never, I'm never going to be a CEO because clearly that's never going to happen. Now, you told me I had to watch 20 hours of television in a day to be a great CEO. Like I'm the next, you know, Steve Jobs. Um, but I discovered Blinkist, which is an amazing, cool app that takes really awesome books and puts them into these like bite-sized digestible. You can either read them or you can listen to them. Um, and you can do 14 books in a day with Blinkist and get the core points. And it then allowed me to find ones that I was like, wow, that's really cool. And then go read the full book. But I got the general ideas and the most important parts of something. So that was something that I found really, really helpful because there's a lot of really cool shortcuts out there, I think. I don't want to say shortcuts, but ways that you can maximize um, doing the things that may not always be the most comfortable for you from your own development education. Um, the other thing is, I would say, you know, be curious. I, I've, I've been so blessed and successful in what I do because I think intrinsically, I just have a really innate curiosity for why stuff works the way it works. It used to be because I loved disproving things. Like I would do it simply to be that punk in a room that was like, that's not the way it is because, you know, um, I love watch, you know, watch things like Adam ruins everything. You know, if you don't know what that is, go look it up. It's an amazing 30 minute show where a guy gets out there and takes the common things that we've all been told and points out, yeah, that's not exactly the way it's, <laughs> it's true. You know, even when I disagree and I'm like, you just ruined something that I was super passionate about. You know, I'm still grateful because expand, expand the way that you understand stuff. I am so passionate about certain things. And, you know, my sister and I completely disagree on recycling, you know, and then she kind of convinced me that I was kind of wrong, you know, because why she pointed me to certain things I hadn't seen or read before because I just got fixated and locked on this one article that I read. And I think it solves a lot. So, I mean, I think if you have the ability to really, really be curious, ask why, you know, when your boss tells you, uh, you know, that we're, we're going to attach the, you know, the QTR five report, because that's the greatest metric of, I don't care about a QTR five report. It's completely irrelevant to me. But if I actually sat and said, you know, Hey boss, what, what, why is the QTR report important? Not in a challenging way, but like, tell me, like, why is this such a relevant thing? Like, you're going to find all of a sudden that, huh, okay, I still hate it. I still think it's stupid, but I understand why they think it's important. You know, it's just a whole different way of approaching something. I think sometimes it's just curiosity. 
Great. And then the last question I have is, what are you most proud of in your career so far? Wow, um, that I've survived. I, I know that sounds like a cop out. Really, honestly, like I, I am I'm surprised so many times, I think, that I've had the ability to impact different people's lives um, when I really never should have been. And I, you know, no one should listen to me. They really shouldn't. I, I'm surprised that anyone's listening to this right now. Like the fact that you've asked me to do this, I will leave this going, why on earth did someone ask me to do that? Like these people are all high if they thought they learned anything from me today. You know, because I think that I am just really, really grateful at the fact that I've been given an opportunity, you know, and, and, and had the chance to recognize that we don't get a second chance. Nobody gets to live two lifetimes in one life. You don't. And it happens all the time. I got that. And I'm lucky for that. The college has been really, really great to me. Um, the people in and around the, the, the Bernathan community, even though I was sort of on the fringe, oftentimes, <laughs> both sometimes spiritually and physically, but I've been embraced, you know, by, by people who have been really loving to me and helped see me transform over the years. Um, but I'm just grateful to have a chance to talk to anybody about what I do, how I do it, and the stuff I don't know, you know, and, and some of this stuff. So I'm just grateful for all of it. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, this brings us to just about one o'clock. So I wanted to um, just do a quick wrap up. Thank you very much, Lance, for all the insights you provide today. We really appreciate you joining us online. And um, thank you to all the members of our virtual audience for logging in, um, both live and those that will watch it after the fact. Um, so it'll be up on YouTube in perpetuity. Um, to take advantage of other career, re career resources from Bernathan College, um, including resume reviews, cover letter reviews, um, those networking connections that I talked about earlier, you can email our Alumni Relations and Advancement Department at alumnirelations at bernathan.edu, or give us a call at 267-502-2444. I look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you again, Lance. Really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Have a great week.